I don't know about you, but one of my favorite times is going to my grandparents' house and hearing them tell stories. I don't know what it is, but it seems like the older we get in life, the better we get at telling stories. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that? Or the older we get in life, the more comfortable we are with talking, and the longer we spend at talking. Um, something I've noticed in the life that I've lived so far. But one of my favorite times is going to my grandfather's house on, on my dad's side of the family, and he is one of the best storytellers that, that I've ever met in my life. And there's a few stories on his list of stories that I like to hear him tell, but one one of the things that he used to share with me is how him and his brother went out into the field and caught the field on fire. And so they were out in the field on a hillside in, in, in Hinton, West Virginia, back in the middle of nowhere. Some of y'all know where that is because God bless you, some of y'all are from there, and we'll pray for you. But nonetheless, uh, they were out there playing on the side of the field, playing with some matches. And what, what they were doing is, is th my grandfather and his brother, they got together and they said, well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's strike the match and throw it on the ground, let the grass catch on fire, and let's stomp it out. And so they did it, they took the match, they lit the match, they threw the match on the ground, and a little fire began to brew and to get going, and they stomped it out real fast. So they got some more matches and struck the match again, threw it down on the grass, and, and the fire did again, and they, they let it go a little bit longer this time and stomped it out real fast. And they did this a, a few times. But one time, they struck the match, and they said, let's let it go a little longer. And they let it go a little longer, and they couldn't stomp it out. So they, they, got, uh, they ran back to the house, got a towel, and started running uh, this, like this with the towel. And you know what air does with a fire. It spreads. And so the next thing you know, uh, my great-grandmother comes out, and, and the family's out there trying to get out this fire on the hillside. And the next thing you know, the entire hill is burning on fire. Well, I share that story to tell you this, that when we see a fire burn, whether it's grass, whether it's wood, whatever it is, it consumes whatever it's burning, and it turns to ashes, and it ceases to exist the way it used to be. But here in our text, we find that, that Moses was on the backside of the desert, and I have seen Mount Hor with my eyes, and yes, it is desert. It is dry. It is, it is just as desert as desert can get. And here we find that, that here Moses takes these sheep. He was a shepherd, and he goes. And, and he sees this fire burn and, and we, 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 we read this story we, we talk about this story, we teach this story but, but I'm here to tell you something this story actually did happen and it took place a few thousand years ago this is not a story that was written by the hand of Moses just to, to tell a great truth but what we find as we read this story as we read this historical account the angel of the Lord, which we tend to believe that every time the angel of the Lord is manifested in the scriptures, that it is a Christophany or a Theophany, that's a fancy way of saying that God manifests himself in the flesh before Christ. And we find that whenever the angel of the Lord occurs in the Old Testament, we believe that, typically speaking, it is a reference to Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. But as we come here in this text, we find that God speaks to him. He takes his shoes off and he gets on holy ground and he, he begins to, to listen to God and God begins to speak with him. But in verse number 11, is where I want to dive into my, for my sermon this, this evening. But, but, but we get to verse 11, and, and Moses asks a few questions. He says, Who am I? And he says, Also, you go on and look in verse number 13. He says, What is his name, and what shall I say unto them? And as I began to read these verses and, and, and study here, we find that God comes to Moses and he's telling Moses, I'm going to send you into the palace of, of, of Pharaoh and you're going to speak on behalf of the people of God and you're going to lead them out unto the land of milk and honey, the promised land. And as I thought about this scene in the Old Testament life, I began to ask myself this question, how can we make this chapter apply to our lives today as a modern, 2017, postmodern, if you will, saint trying to live their life for the glory of God? Well, I want you to notice, it says in, uh, in verse number 10, these, these words, it says, I will send thee unto Pharaoh. And then also, I want you to, to note in, in verse number 4, it says, God speaks to him, and Moses says, Here am I. And then notice in verse number 16, the first word of the text, it says, Go. 
In verse number 12, it says, I have sent thee. And as I begin to, to read these words and to talk about uh, these things in my own mind and think about them, and I wanted to talk about to you about this thought this evening, stop making excuses and just share the gospel. Stop making excuses and just share the gospel. Listen, I, I've heard it. My, I, you, you've heard all the, te all the excuses, and I like what old one preacher said. Excuses are like ears. Everybody's got two of them, and they stick out. And then another preacher said, everybody's got excuses. It's just like armpits. Both, uh, people got two of them, and they sure do stink. We all can make up excuses to say, hey, I don't know enough about the Bible, so I'm not going to share it with anybody. We're going to say, well, I, I just, uh, I get scared and I get nervous, so I just don't want to share the gospel with anybody. We say, well, I, I, I stutter. I, I don't, I, I'm not a good talker in front of people, and I just don't do well with talking in conversations about spiritual matters. Well, we find out that, that we can go on and on about these excuses, but you don't have to have a Ph.D. in, in uh, evangelism. You don't have to have a Ph.D. in uh, theology. You don't have to have all that educational background. You don't have to have anything but a testimony of salvation to go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ. And as we come here in this segment, let's take note. Stop making excuses and just go share the gospel. It's time that we get off our pews and we get out into the land and we just share the gospel. I wrote down this statement that if you walk away with anything, I want you to walk away with this. Making excuses has no place for sharing the gospel. Making excuses has no place for sharing the gospel. Now before we dive into this text, I want to just share this with you. I want to analyze two of Moses' questions and then give you two thoughts to answer each of those questions. So in verse number 11, I want to zoom in and, and think about this thought. Who am I that I should go share the gospel? And then in verse number 13, as I read this, uh, this verse, I wrote down this question that we can take and we can use the question there and try to make application in our own life. What will I say when I share the gospel? So, who am I that I should share the gospel? And then number two, what will I say when I share the gospel? So who am I that I should share the gospel, and what will I say when I share the gospel? And then as we ask and answer question number one, I wrote down this, go or share the gospel because God will be with you. And then as I read verse 13, I wrote down this, share the gospel because God has sent you. And then as we try to ask and answer verse, uh, the question from verse number 13, what will I say when I share the gospel? Tell them God sent you to share the gospel. And then I wrote down this. God will give you the words to speak when you share the gospel. Will you come with me as we move through this? But I want you to go back to verse number one. It says in verse number one that Moses kept the flock. He was a shepherd. And a shepherd was, it was an occupation that's very common. He, let's just put it this way. He wasn't making a, a bunch of bucks working as a shepherd. He was just making a, an average living and living an average lifestyle as a shepherd in his day and time. And it goes in to say that, remember, back in chapter number 2, he uh, went away because he um, killed somebody. And they, they began to go after him, and he was helping some ladies down at a well. And, and the father called uh, for him to come and partake in a meal, and he eventually marries one of the daughters. And we find that, that the, uh, the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, Jethro is mentioned here in verse number 1 of chapter 3, and it says he was the priest of Midian. And he led the flock into the backside of the desert and came to the mount, mountain of God, even to Horeb. It's so cool when you, when you, if you ever get a chance to go over to the Middle East and to see Israel, you, I, I would advise you to do it. I know it's a, a pricey endeavor, but, but if you could ever get a package like I did and go for free, well, you should do it. I'm telling you, you should. You just might regret the flight over there. And if you are, if you are susceptible, or if you are going to get blood clots, you just got to make sure you walk around the airplane a few times because, listen, it's no fun. Anyways, what I like about it is I went over there and I saw all these places I studied. In the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we hear all these people, these skeptics come in and say the Bible is just a bunch of fairy tales. Well, if the Bible is just a bunch of fairy tales, then why does it mention specific places that are still in existence to this day? 
So I saw with my own eyes Mount Horeb. We didn't actually go visit that one, but I saw it from a distance. And it's very cool. And it says that the angel of the Lord, so we believe this was Jesus Christ in the flesh. And it says that appeared to him in a flame of fire. So here this bush is burning, but it's not being consumed. Just imagine putting a fire in your fireplace or your wood stove, uh, and, and you go and you put wood in, and the wood is burning. Uh, the fire is burning, but the wood stays there, and the wood does not turn to ashes. That's what it was doing here. The, the, the bush was burning, and the bush was not turning into ashes. And we find that, that it was not consumed, the Bible says, but notice that, that early, later in the New New Testament book of Hebrews, the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. And if you let God get a hold of your life, He will consume you and use you in a great way. Verse number 3 says that Moses says, I'm going to now go turn and, and take a look at this. As all the young people say, I'm going to go check it out. And by the way, let's check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. And whenever God speaks to us, we need to take a few moments and listen to what He says. Verse 4 goes on to say that the Lord took note that, that He went aside to take a look at this burning bush, and He called out to Moses. And He said, Moses, Moses, whenever God calls, listen, you better just do what He says. It doesn't matter if people don't like the way God has called you. Well, you've got to do what God says to do. And Moses said, Here am I. We find a few other Old Testament characters, Isaiah and uh, the one in Samuel, I think it was Samuel, uh, who, who, or one of the characters in the book of Samuel, who call, God called him out and he, they said, here am I. And it goes on to verse number five, it says, draw not thy hither, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. I heard about a pastor um, in the runner, I think it was Brother Chip over there at Cave Spring Baptist. Um, every time he preached, he would take his shoes off because he believed that this was holy ground. Very neat, very neat idea, just respecting the place of preaching the Word of God. But here we find that he was standing on holy ground, and God commanded him to take off his shoes out of respect. Verse 6, it says that God spoke to him, and he said, I am the God of your father. I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. I'm the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. In the New Testament book of John, the first John, we find that the Bible says that one of these days we'll be like Him, for we will see Him as He is. And one of these days we'll be able to look upon God face to face as I'm looking at you and you're looking at me. But until now, from this present time, we're unable to do that. Because God is so holy. His, His glory is so vast that it, it, the Bible gives a connotation that if we were to just take a little small glimpse of the full splendor and glory of God, we would not be able to contain it and handle it. So Moses turned away his face. He was afraid. Fear, by the way, is the number one reason why people don't share their faith. Verse 7 God speaks and says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmakers, for I know their sorrows. Remember back in chapter number 1, we find that a Pharaoh came on the scene who didn't know Joseph and didn't like the Hebrews because they were populating the place. And apparently they were getting to a place where they were either outnumbering the Egyptians or they were getting pretty close to outnumbering them. And so they began to treat them as slaves and they worked them hard and hard and hard. And, and we find that, that Moses is raised up. And, and in verse number 23 and 24 and 25 of chapter 2, we find that the people of God prayed to God about their affliction. They cried out to God. And then here we find that in verse number 7 of chapter number 3, God heard their prayers and He answers them. And I'm glad that God can always hear and answer our prayers. Verse 8, it says, And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land, and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm not a big fan of milk, but listen, I sure do like honey, because it's sweet to the taste buds. And here we find that this land was just, a, these, these terms milk and honey was just a, a, a symbol of a land full of prosperity. And if you go to Israel, you'll find that, yes, it is full of desert areas, but it's also the breadbasket of the Middle East. It's interesting that a little plot of land in the Middle East feeds the majority in the Middle East, right there in Israel. That's why they call it the bread basket of the Middle East. But nonetheless, it's full of, of great uh, land to produce crops. 
And it talks about how it's the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. These are actual people groups back in their day. Verse number 9, it says, Therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. So this affliction and oppression gives the connotation of distressful trials in their life. And verse 10 says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh. So here we find that, that God is sending Moses, going to the palace in Egypt, and going to speak on behalf of Almighty God and the people of Israel to the man in charge of Egypt. And when God told him this, Abe had a few questions for God. Three, in fact, but we're only going to look at two of them. But as we look at these questions, we need to understand that just as Moses asked these questions before God, when, when Jesus Christ came, He lived a sinless life. As you know the story of the gospel, and He died on Calvary's cross, He rose again. And as He was ascending up to heaven, the Bible says that, that, that there as He ascended, before, right before He did, he, he gave the great commission. And in the gospel of Mark, it says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And yes, that all it means is to every Jew and to every Jew. Gentile. And as we read these verses in the New Testament, as we look here, I'm reminded of, of the commission God has given you and me to go out and to share the good news of salvation. But just as Moses had excuses, I have had excuses. We've all had excuses. There's been times when God would lay upon my heart to, to share with somebody that I was in conversation with to just transition to whatever we were talking about and move to spiritual matters and just to share the gospel with them. And there, I, I'm ashamed to say there's been many a times where I failed to do that. Now, there's been many times where I've succeeded and was obedient to, that, to the Spirit leading. And there's everybody here in this auditorium have been in the same shoes. But the message this evening is, is this. Let's stop making excuses and just go share the gospel. Making excuses has no place for sharing the gospel. Look at verse 11 with me. In verse 11, the Bible says that Moses finally responds. After he said, here am I, those are the only three words that Moses spoke until verse number 11. He began to listen to God. And listen, if uh, you could just go back to that scene, you're on the backside of the desert on Mount Horeb, and, and you see a bush burning, and it's not being consumed. And then all of a sudden, that bush just starts speaking to you. Well, that would be a little crazy, right? You would have think somebody spiked your drink earlier, right? But we find here he asks some questions, and he says, Who am I? that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. So I wrote down this question, based upon Moses' question. Who am I that I should share the gospel? Who am I that I should share the gospel? I hear it all so many times, but all it is is an excuse. People say to me on multiple occasions, I am unworthy to share the gospel. Yes. You're unworthy to share this message. I'm unworthy to share this message. The only thing that we're worth is spending eternal torments burning in a lake of fire. That's what we're worth because of our sin. And God in His grace and His mercy, He has called us out on the salvation and then sent us out into the world to deliver that salvation to us all, to everybody else in the world. So, so before we start saying that I'm unworthy to share the gospel message, listen, let's face the facts. We're all unworthy to share this message. So don't let that stop you from sharing the gospel. But I want to draw your attention to this question. And, and in verse number 12, I want you to zoom in on these words. It says, God responds this, Certainly I will be with thee. So I wrote down this thought. Share the gospel because God is with us. Share the gospel because God is with us. Remember earlier in our passage in verse number 6, it says that Moses hid his face before God because he was afraid to look upon God. There's times in our lives where, yes, we're afraid of God because of something in our life, maybe sin and, and this, that, and the third, but, but then there's times in our life where we're afraid to speak upon, uh, on behalf of God. But I want to remind us what God told Moses. He said, I will be with thee. So when you're out trying to share the gospel, God is with you. God is with you. So there's no need to fear. The fear of man brings a snare, the Old Testament says. The fear of God brings wisdom. And 
I firmly believe that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. And He's always going to be with you if you're a child of the living God and you know Christ is Savior. The Holy Spirit of God resides in you. Therefore, God is always with you. Even when you're sharing the gospel. So, so just imagine, two is better than one, right? The Bible says that in the, the Old Testament. And so whenever you're going out to share the gospel, it's not just you that's doing it. It's you and you got the Holy Spirit along the way as well. So share the gospel because God is with you. And here we find that eventually in chapters 4 and moving on that, 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 that God sends Moses into the, the Pharaoh's palace and, and God is with them every step of the way. We're going to get into some of these chapters and some of the crazy things that go on with the plagues and all this, that, and, and everything else going on. But, but I want you to notice that as you read the Old Testament the book of Exodus, every chapter, God was right there with them. God was right there with them when... When he stood there before Pharaoh. God was right there with him when he was out in the wilderness. It was supposed to be a three days journey which turned into 40 years. God was with him every step of the way. God was with him when, when the manna came down from heaven. When the water came out of the rocks. When, when the Red Sea parted. God was with Moses every step of the way. God was with Moses when, when the serpents came and they looked upon the, the, the bronze serpent. And, and they looked and lived. And, and every step of the life of Moses we find that God was with him. And if God was with Moses... God is with us. Verse number 12 goes on to say, Certainly I will be with you. So share the gospel because God is with us. But then the Bible goes on to say, And this shall be a token unto thee. Notice these words, That I have sent thee. So I underline the words, I will be with thee. And I underline the words, I have sent thee. So not only did I write down, share the gospel because God is with us, but I wrote down this, share the gospel because God has sent us. Share the gospel because God has sent us. The greatest message this world has to offer is not if LeBron James is better than Michael Jordan or if LeBron James is going to beat Steph Curry in the NBA Finals. The greatest message in the world is not who's going to win the, the NHL Cup. It's not about who's going to win the NASCAR race. It's not about which celebrities done messed up this time or struck it rich this time. The greatest message in the world is not even a cure for cancer. It's the cure for sin, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know we, we, we speak about this a lot, but, but I just want to remind us all. That let's say by chance you came across and discovered the cure for cancer. And you went, and you know what you would do? You would try to take it to every doctor you know in this area and beyond. And you would want the, for everybody to know what the cure of cancer is so the people that have cancer can uh, get a, a cure for that disease. Well, there's a disease called sin, which is a whole lot more worse than the physical aspect of cancer. See, cancer only lasts for a lifetime, but the disease of sin can last for all eternity. And so I submit to all of us this evening that it is urgent, it is extremely urgent that we get out there and we share the gospel because we've been commissioned and sent by Almighty God. It's not the missionary overseas job to just share the gospel. It's not the preacher's job. It's, it's not Brother Andrew's job. It's not, it's, not, it's not just one particular group of individuals within the umbrella of Christianity. It's every Christian that calls Christ his Savior's job to get out there and share the gospel. And I realize that some people may not get paid to share the gospel. But listen, in this lifetime, you may not get paid to do that. But let me tell you something. Something in the next life, in eternal life, you will be rewarded for the times that you shared the gospel. I'm not saying we need to get out there and, and count how many people we've led to Christ. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is that we need to get our seeds, we need to get the gospel seed, and we need to throw it out there as much and as often as we can. It doesn't matter if that seed lands on hard soil or soft soil or good soil or whatever soil. We need to get the seeds of the gospel. We need to take the message of Christ and just throw it out there. Because the more you sow, the more you'll reap. And the more we send, the more we will reap and reward in heaven. It's imagine, just imagine, if you were to take a box, a pound of sunflower seeds, and you were to throw them in your garden, 
Just throw them in the garden. You don't have to have any order in them. You just throw them in the field, in the, in the, in the tilled garden there. And sooner or later, the sunflower plants are going to come up, and you're going to see them. It may not be in a straight row or anything, but you're going to see them. And then you're going to have more seeds from those flowers. You're going to, you'll be able to produce more. And so, so this is what God has called us to do. He's called us to go out and to share the good news. And you see, making disciples starts with evangelism. And then it also discusses discipleship, baptism, and then teaching those to go and do likewise. Verse number 11, Moses asked, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? I ask myself this question. Who am I that I should share the gospel? Well, share the gospel because God is with us. Share the gospel because God has sent us. But now I want to draw your attention to verse 13. As we move into this verse, we find that Moses asked two questions, which kind of can be summarized into one question. What he says in the end of verse number 13. But, well, let's read the whole verse. It says, Moses said to God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? I want to zoom in that last question. What shall I say unto them? So I wrote down the second question, based upon Moses' question. What will I say when I share the gospel? What will I say when I share the gospel? A lot of people use the excuse, I just don't know enough about the Bible to try to tell somebody about Jesus. Well, do you know John 3.16? Can you quote John 3.16? Certainly. Just about everybody in here, I'm confident, could. Well, that's all you need to know to share the gospel is John 3.16. As I look at verse 13, I wrote down this question. What shall I say when I go? Well, in verses 14 and 15, I wrote down this thought. Tell them God has sent you. Tell them God has sent us. So in verse number 14, we find that God replies to Moses' question. He says, I am that I am. And by the way, when you, you read these, this verse, I am that I am, and he goes on to say, tell them that, that I am has sent me, me unto you. Whenever we read verse 14, my mind always jumps over to the Gospel of John. If you know anything about the Gospel of John, you know that the Bible talks about the, the I am's that Jesus. He said, I am the bread of life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He said, I am the resurrection. He said, I am the door. He said, I am the true vine. He said, I am the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. He said, I am, I am, I am multiple times. And we find that whenever he said, I am, you know what he was referring to? He was referring to right here, back in Exodus chapter number 3. He was just... He was de declaring to all the Jewish Pharisees, all the Sadducees, that I am God Almighty in the flesh. So, listen, when, all, when uh, a couple ladies might knock on your door or a couple men uh, from the Kingdom Hall and they try to teach you otherwise that Jesus Christ is not God, just point them back to old the Gospel of John and right here uh, back to the book of Exodus chapter 3 about how Jesus Christ is the same God that Jehovah is in the Old Testament. Same one. And so, I am has sent me unto you. Verse 15, And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Wow. Did you read that? All generations. So, so from this moment forward, all the way for, for, for the rest of the history of mankind, we find that the people of Israel, the Old Testament, the Old Testament saints, were to know God by the phrase I am and so when Jesus said it he caused a great stir amongst some of those individuals in the New Testament because it revealed who he was and who he said he was and so the same God who right here says I am has sent you Moses 
That same God is Jesus who has said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go proclaim that gospel. The word proclaim and the word preach, it literally means to, to, to herald forth the message, to, to get a bullhorn, one of those horns that, that, that sometimes we would use back in the street preaching days when we were going pretty faithfully. We'd get the horn on the street corner and we would just proclaim and herald the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Or are you standing on the street corner without the bullhorn and just lifting up your voice and raising it so that people can hear the Word of God? That's what it refers to. And so when people say, well, well, who said, who said you had the authority to, to, to talk about that? Well, the authority that I have been given is from the mouth of Almighty God. I have been sent not by the President of the United States. I have not been sent by the Queen or King of England. I have not been sent by any other institution in the world, but by Almighty God Himself. So if you don't like the message we have here, yes, I believe in doing it compassionately, but yet courageously. But if somebody doesn't like the message we have here, they're going to have to take it up with God on Judgment Day. Because the Bible says what it says, and I believe every single word of it. Amen. Tell them God has sent you. But then as I read verses 16 and 18, 16 through 18, I wrote down this thought. God will give us the words to speak. What shall I say when I share the gospel? Well, tell them God has sent you. And then God will give you the words to speak. There's been many times where I've been out sharing the gospel or just out doing this and doing that. And the conversations would shift to salvation. And God would recall by the Spirit verses into my mind to share. Or illustrations or stories or something that would be a, a great context of the conversation to move forward with sharing the gospel. You see, yes, I believe in, in daily meditating in the Word of God. I believe, yes, that it's important that, that we teach children to memorize Scripture and that they do that. And many of these young people, these children that are here, they know a lot of Scripture. And you know what it's going to do? Later in their life, when they're out sharing the Gospel, they're going to be able to recall that passage of Scripture that they memorized because they memorized it as a child. You see, I am still able to remember some verses I memorized as a child. One of those verses was Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. There's these verses that are just lodged in my memory forever. Unless, you know, I get a disease and lose some of those memories. But we find that, that God is going to give us the words to speak. Verse 16, Go, God says, and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. I have, and I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of the Egypt, of Egypt unto the land of Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk. And in the, in the Hebrew, brother Dave, that means almond milk. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. And in the Hebrew, that word honey means raw honey. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Uh, verse 18, he goes on to say, And they shall hearken to thy voice, and sh thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto them, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us, and now let us go, we beseech thee, the three days journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. God told them exactly what to say, and you know what? God has given us exactly what to say. The Bible says faith comes by, we said it earlier, faith comes by hearing the Word of God, and we find that the way to discover what to share when we're out promoting the gospel is found in God's Word. It's important that we, that we familiarize ourselves with God's Word. Some passages like, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Passages like, for the wage of sin is death, but to get to God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Passages like, for He has made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in Him. Passages like, for God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Passages like, Romans chapter 10, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus 
Zacchaeus and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth in the salvation, and with the heart uh, the confession is made. We find that these verses uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and many others. We need to familiarize ourselves with them so that when we go out and share the gospel, we have a storage tank that we can feed off of. We can prepare for the days. It's interesting. I don't know how true these stats are. But when I was a freshman in college, I was studying at Liberty University at the time, before I transferred to a Bible college. And the first book I had in my evangelism class was by a guy named Alvin Reed. It was, it was a book about evangelism. And in this book, it was written back uh, either in the early 2000s, I think it was in the early 2000s. And he said in that book, 3 to 5% of Christians share their faith on a regular basis. So that means if there was 100 people here, only 3 to 5 of them shared their faith on a regular basis. Does that concern you? Well, it concerns me. <coughs> and we have to figure out ways that we can share our faith. We can do it by conversations, through passing out tracts. Just, you know, one of the easiest things to do is when you go to Walmart and you, you, you go through the line. I myself, I try my best to go into the, to the self-checkouts because it's faster and easier. But whenever I go through a line with a cashier, I try to make sure I have gospel tracts and I just say, hey, read this. It changed my life. It's a great way. One simple way. You don't have to say anything, but just read this. It changed my life. There's so many ways, and it's good to get creative. Today's message is very simple. Let's stop making excuses and just go share the gospel. We know God is going to be with us. We know God has sent us, and we know God is going to give us the words to say. So let's launch out in faith even more and try to reach our community here with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father,